All right, today's talk is on memory, and I'm very excited to talk about this topic. It obviously has a lot of interest out there. Before we begin the memory talk, though, I have a little video for you, and we're going to see if our equipment works. We were having some trouble earlier. All right, now this little video, we got to make sure we can hear it. If anybody's seen this before, please don't uh, nudge your neighbor and tell them that you're, you've seen this and you know what it's all about. So let's, all right. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? turn this off. All right. Well, the reason I wanted to show that to you, this is actually a famous te uh, psychology test. How we see things, how we perceive things, um, it has a big effect on what we might someday remember. So the importance of focusing so that we can see is going to be very critical in our ability to make sense of memory and loss of memory. Now, what I like to do when I talk about these topics is I like to thread together a lot of various topics and interests of mine. In this story today that we talk about memory, you're going to see that there is a connection to one of my favorites, Albert Einstein, the Beatles, Woody Allen, Mel Brooks. How could they possibly connect to a topic on, a scientific topic on memory? But as we go along, you'll see there are connections here. The, the star of the show is the brain. And the reason I have uh, this little miniature chihuahua, which I think may be the smallest breed. Um, it's about, this one's supposed to be about, th about three pounds. A human brain is about three pounds, okay? So it weighs about as much as this little chihuahua. I know they make chihuahuas bigger than this, but <laughs> that one I thought was about three pounds. It has the consistency of jello. That's pretty much a fairly accurate assessment. Um, it contains a, a boggling 300 trillion connections in each of our brains. <laughs> And before we get too proud of ourselves, think about uh, dogs probably have 200 trillion, so, you know. <laughs> but, but that's still pretty good, 300 trillion connections. So there's a lot going on in the brain, and there's enough wiring or axons to go halfway to the moon. Okay? <laughs> now, the brain is not that heavy. It only weighs about, like we said, three pounds. It's about 2% of the human body. But it uses 15% of the blood flow, 20% of the oxygen, and 25% of the glucose, okay? So this explains that we all understand, you know, a person can't have their blood pressure too low or they get woozy. A person can't be in low oxygen up in the altitude, woozy again. Same thing here, low sugar, hypoglycemic. That is how dependent the brain is on all these resources in high quantities. Looking at the brain, there are a lot, I mean, you know, in the modern world, we, you know, it's no big deal to look at the brain. We, we do it all the time here in the hospital. I'd be curious to know how many people here had a, had a CAT scan of their brain. Could, you, could people raise their hand? Would, how many people? Did Just I out of curiosity. No. I mean, there, it's a fair number. It's, it's actually surprising. So the CAT scan, the MRI gives us more detailed information. Here's a PET scan. We'll get back to this later. And this is another way to look at the brain. This is the electrical activity of the brain. People know that, what this is? Does anybody remember these? No. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, an EEG, right. I mean, you don't hear about that much, but it's still uh, used for seizure. But in the old days, that used to be one of the, break, the, the primary ways you knew about the brain. And, and there are other ways to know about the brain. There's its anatomic structure. There's its microscopic structure. Um, and then these are all the folds of the brain uh, and with little cellular uh, inform information or views here under the microscope. Or you can know about the brain chemically, the chemistry of the brain. And finally, the, the way we also, we all know that each of us has a brain. There's only, there's only two ways to know if somebody has a brain in, in the modern world. One is you talk to them and you figure it out. And maybe you think some people don't have much of a brain. 
you could do a scan and prove that they have a brain. And I, I think always people get a kick out of the idea that, you know, I had a scan, do I have a brain? I mean, it's sort of a funny question, but then again, do you? <laughs> so, you know, the issue at hand is, is our concerns about our memory. That's what we're talking about today. You know, is memory loss normal? Is this a medical issue that I have? And a more feared concern is dementia or uh, marked loss of higher intellectual function. And that is code, if you will, for Alzheimer's disease. And we'll talk about why that is code for Alzheimer's disease. It, it, it's a fairly accurate de description. Now, I don't want to get too serious, but I wanted to tell a joke. This is Woody Allen from Sleeper, if you don't remember him. But uh, this is an important organ. The joke is, is uh, sort of demonstrates why or how we're going to approach the topic. In the joke, there's a radio announcer who's interviewing people on the street, the man on the street, and asking what the most important invention of the 20th century was. So he comes to the first fellow and he says, what do you think the most important invention of the 20th century was? And he goes, the radio. And the interviewer says, well, why would that be? He goes, well, the radio wireless communicates amazing amounts of information to a vast number of people that never before could have heard that information. He goes, very good, I agree. That's a very amazing invention. He moves on to his next fellow who he asks, and the fellow says, well, the rocket ship. I think the rocket ship's amazing. Why is that, he asks. He says, well, the rocket ship's amazing because it allows us to leave the planet, come back, look at the Earth, realize our place in it, and return safely. Very good, says the interviewer. And then finally, he approaches a fellow who doesn't seem quite with it. He wasn't sure what his problem was, but he said to him, what do you think the most important thing in the 20th century, the most important invention? He said, I think it's the thermos. He goes, well, why would that be? He goes, well, it keeps hot things hot and cold things cold. He goes, uh-huh. And what makes that so special? And he said, how do it know? <laughs> so, so I, which is a, you know, it's, now this is an old joke, but how do it know? How do it know is a, is a comment we could use about a lot of things. Patients ask me, can I take all my pills together? Uh, they, they know. <laughs> Where to go? You can take them all together. They know. How do it know? I don't know how it knows, but it know. But it really gets down to how do we know, and how do we know about the brain? So I'm going to talk about some of the history of um, the science of studying brain and how we learned about it. Um, and some of it is interesting. I, I think a lot of it you may not know. Some of it will be a refresher, maybe from science class. It won't get boring, though. This is the first area we're going to delve into, this fellow, Phineas Gage, he has a problem, or really he had a problem. His problem was he had a crowbar in his brain. Now, this is not a picture, just so you're not grossed out. These are later day reconstructions of Phineas Gage's brain. Phineas Gage was studied both during his, uh, during his lifetime, which was somewhat brief. He, he survived this injury. And then even more interesting, studying later by this fellow, among others, Dr. Damasio, who's one of the, maybe the premier brain researcher in the world. He's currently at USC um, and, and runs their brain center. And they did reconstructions, CT reconstructions. But um, Phineas Gage was a railroad worker who had aged 25 in, 19, or in 1848, uh, strapping good health. He suffered a blasting injury where his tamping rod, which is basically an old fashioned version of a crowbar, made a one and a quarter inch hole in his left eye and through his left frontal lobe of his brain. These pictures of Phineas Gage are very uh, famous because he was a well-known um, personage uh, during those years. He was uh, uh, a, a, a person of interest, if you will, during those years. And uh, due to his hardiness, his great fortitude, he survived the injury, which was described below by his doctor. His name was Dr. Edward Williams, who noticed the wound upon his head as he said, before I alighted from my carriage, the pulsations of the brain very, being very distinct, Mr. Gage, during the time I was examining his wound, was relating the manner in which he was injured. Now, Gage became, as we said, a well-known person who was, at the time, a very plain sort of fellow, not very uh, uh, want to react aggressively or anything like that, but subsequent to the injury, he became very aggressive and very uncharacteristic. This connection, if you will, between the injury that he survived, which he could relate to, that the uh, people of the day, the scientists of the day, studied. And they claimed, if you will, that um, they debated 
the sources and the uh, areas where the brain uh, was involved with certain attributes. And he was injured in the frontal lobe, and now the researchers are trying to reconstruct what happened to him and why he had certain changes in his behavior. So we understand, or people understood at that time in the 1800s, that sections of the brain controlled different areas of uh, activity and different aspects of personality. Now, more importantly, others came along who were studied more um, scientifically. H.M., uh, these are people who are known throughout the psychology and the neuro neuro neurology world. H.M. Uh, had a, a seizure disorder at a very young age and required surgery um, to, for his intractable uh, seizures. He was eight years old when he injured himself. He was 26 years old when the surgeons in Connecticut removed his temporal lobes, these areas in the brain here, okay? This is H.M.'s brain here, lacking these areas. And H.M. suffered immediately something called anterograde amnesia. He could not remember anything new. He could remember everything old, but he could form no new memories. And he was studied for about 60 years by many researchers, and he even lived on into the 80s uh, and was studied under MRI scans and so forth. Um, and they know for a fact the injuries that he sustained included the removal of this hippocampus, something Kelly mentioned before, and this area called the amygdala that seemed to be uh, particularly pertinent for the development of future memory. And his brain now resides in La Jolla in the brain center studied at uh, the Scripps Clinic there. I'll tell about one final patient who had an injury. This fellow, not that injury, he just got injured, but he was injured by a, <laughs> just an interesting picture. He was injured by a miniature foil. He and his buddies in the army, the Italian army, were roughhousing. The miniature foil uh, happened to end up his nose. It injured his brain, cutting his, he lived, he survived, cutting this very small area, a kind of injury that could happen in almost no other way, called the mammillary body. The selective de deficits that he had for memory were compared to HM. In fact, they were studied together by the same researchers, trying to identify, well, this fellow lost just the mammillary body, uh, HM lost the hippocampus and the amygdala. They started to localize where certain aspects of memory would be derived uh, in the uh, structures of the brain. And then this person, not the structure so much, but the, the microscopic structure, August Dieter, in the late 1900s was an asylum patient. And he suffered from dementia, actually. And when he passed away, this physician, Alois Alzheimer, uh, was able to obtain his brain for study. So mm -hmm. this is uh, the, the doctor after whom Alzheimer's disease is named. And what he found when he studied Dieter's, August Dieter's brain was this finding. He used a special stain that had just become available. Stains are uh, derivatives of dyes from the dye company or the dye industry in Germany. So the Germans tend to do a lot of these dye studies um, and microscope studies long before Americans could uh, effectively. And what he found was these plaques and tangles, these may be terms I think people have heard about that relate to uh, Alzheimer's dementia specifically. These are the plaques, this sort of reddish or pinkish area, and these are the tangles. Okay? And we're going to come back and talk about what these are because we know what these are and we know how we're starting to come to a better understanding of how it plays a role in the development of Alzheimer's. This pathology, although people can have these kind of findings under the microscope in their brain and not develop Alzheimer's, if somebody has Alzheimer's, they must have these findings, okay? And if somebody says, does a person have Alzheimer's disease, the only way to be absolutely certain is to have these findings at autopsy. Now, aside from studying the brain anatomically, studying the brain through its a microscope or microscopy, we could also study it chemically. And there are over 100 billion cells in the brain um, with the 300 trillion connections. So there's lots of connections, lots of cells. And we're going to go back in time just a little bit uh, to basic biology class and just talk about the two types of cells you know, I, called neurons, which is the long nerve cell that transmits information, the glial cell. I'll just give a brief comment about glial cells, which are support cells, these blue cells, red cells, supporting these long neurons. These are the neurons that are passing on their information through uh, a process that we'll talk about. And it turns out that 90% of our cells in our brain actually are these glial cells. There's probably a lot more to understand about the brain when we understand what these glial cells for do fully, but it's this, the neuron, that's sort of the star of the show, because this is what's transmitting information and storing information directly as we understand it. Now, the uh, neuron 
uh, has a long tail that we call the axon, okay? And the neuron receives information through these areas of the cell called the dendrites and then passes that information along to the end of the cell called the axon. And I'll explain why we're learning about this. This is a certain kind of cell called a Purkinje cell. It has a lot of those connections. And this has been dissected out of a brain with special microscopy. This is just a, 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 you know, a drawing. So these axons, just to give you a, a flavor for how thin they are, there are a hundred of them can fit inside this microscope picture of a human hair. Okay? So they pack them in there. They're lined with a myelin sheath or a fatty sheath. And they're sending signals from here, the center, down here to this end. And the reason they're sending it to the end is they want to communicate. Um, and they communicate uh, by an electrical process that um, ca will cause an electrical process through this length and then a chemical process down here at the, the end of the axon or the synapse. And this is why when people do EEGs, like we saw before, there's a lot of electrical activity in the brain because all these nerves are firing off sending their chemical signals, but the chemical signal first has to be transmitted as an electrical impulse. The impulses, just to show you here, demonstrated, have to do with the flow of sodium and potassium across the membrane of the cells, those nerve cells. Um, and there is a, it's almost like a battery. There's a negative charge on one side, a positive charge. They alter their charges and send an electrical signal, okay? And that's why when we check like sodium and potassium in the bloodstream, we're, we understand that sodium and potassium are intimately involved in these electrical signals in the brain, in the electrical signals in muscles, okay? And they end up here at the end of the neuron called the synapse. This is, you hear people use the word synapse. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the neuron ends and it's about to touch the next cell, but it doesn't touch it. It communicates through this cleft or uh, synaptic gap, okay? And it sends its signals, its chemical signals out, and this nerve will then absorb the signals and Pa pass its information on. And just to show you, this is a drawing, of course, with these little receptacles that have the chemicals. This, for instance, this will store serotonin. This will store acetylcholine. This will store GABA. In other words, this is the stuff that makes you happy. This is the stuff that helps memory. This is the stuff that uh, relaxes you, okay? That nerves are transmitting. And here's a picture of this. Actually, an electron microscope, you actually see this is an actual live nerve end and all these little vesicles of chemicals are being stored here, waiting to touch the end and open up and release their chemistry. And in here we see a diagram of that. This is uh, serotonin, which is the chemical we think of for mood. Uh, this nerve uh, emits serotonin to this cleft. This nerve takes it up. And this is where our drugs work, for instance, our um, like Prozac, Zoloft. They, this, this cell tries to absorb its own production, its own serotonin. Prozac will block that, leaving more in between the cells to communicate and stimulate the, cell, the next cell on. That's how it works. Now, there are many chemicals that the brain uses for communicating. Uh, there's acetylcholine, which we'll talk about, that uh, is involved in memory, norepinephrine, memory and mood, dopamine. Does anybody know the diseases that we think of when people say dopamine is deficient? Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. Exactly. That's Parkinson's. Serotonin, we already spoke of that. Glutamate is also involved a bit in memory. GABA, does anybody know what GABA does? Why we love GABA? GABA is, the, that GABA is a chemical that Valium mimics and all the anxiolytics. So if you give, that's why people say take GABA and feel relaxed. Unfortunately, you can't take GABA because it won't get into the brain well. But you take Valium or similar drugs, they will relax you. And enkephalins, these are like the endorphins, you know, the highs, okay? So these are, this is the chemistry that's communicating. Now besides this chemistry, the chemistry of communication, there's the chemistry that we want to understand about these plaques, okay? And the chemistry of the plaque is, simply put, there's the, the cell membrane or the lining of the cell. Around the cell is this um, amyloid protein that's demonstrated here. And when it is broken apart, it turns into the beta amyloid, which then congregates and creates the plaque, okay? So this is our understanding. It's sitting in the cell on its surface doing something. I can't tell you what it's supposed to be doing, but it breaks off, <coughs> breaks down, and then accumulates. This isn't good for the brain. We can actually, with new computer systems, know the three-dimensional structure of that amyloid protein. 
sort of weird. This is how it fits in space. And the reason this is important is chemicals come together spatially. So we have to understand the proteins and how they fit together, so like a lock and a key, so they can interact. The other item that we're looking at are the tangles. We have mentioned those, the plaques and the tangles. Okay, the tangles are made up of this substance called tau protein. Now, imagine we talked about those lengthy nerves, okay? They had a long tail, and there are a hundred of those in one hair. Inside that lengthy tail, there are multiple, what are called microtubules, little tubes that line inside of here. When they break down, that's when the tau protein uh, is released. So these are tubules that are sort of like the support scaffolding that go the entire length of the nerve and act almost like a bucket brigade, sending nutrients down from the, the center of the nerve all the way down to the end of the nerve, okay? And this, when this bucket brigade breaks down, the tau protein is released, it creates the tangle. So we know that. We know this part of the chemistry. And so, too, we know the, um, the three-dimensional structure of those proteins. Important in medicine to discuss normal <laughs> and abnormal. <laughs> so here's the Mel Brooks reference. And Hans Delbruck was a famous um, a peacemaker of his time, I guess. That's, that's the brain he was supposed to get, Hans Delbruck. But he dropped it and instead picked up this one. Of course, the rest is humorous history. Back in the office, I want to now relate this back to the office and how do we approach this issue. Now, we've learned a little bit of sort of the basic science of what's going on, how we figured it out, a little bit of it at least. And so we have questions. How does this come about? Usually somebody comes to the office and they say, I think I, my memory's not as good as it was. Do I have a problem? Or my family member, my wife, my husband, somebody, my, my parent, their memory isn't as good. How do we start the process? It's pretty basic. We do the same thing every time. You guys probably get tired of it. I do, at least. I, I don't get tired of it, but I do it every day. This is what I do. The history, the exam, the labs, and the Im imaging. This is sort of the process we go through. So this is how we approach patients now. Before we begin, we have to have a sense of what are we looking for. If somebody's got a memory problem, what is the likelihood that they have a certain kind of memory problem? Now, we're not going to define dementia exactly here now, but when we're talking about dementia, notice if somebody says, do I have dementia, they're really saying, do I have Alzheimer's disease? Because 62%, and this, there, there are different studies, about 60% of dementia is Alzheimer's, okay? Some of it, about 10%, is what they call mixed. We'll come back to this. Alzheimer's plus vascular dementia. Strokes, microstrokes, other kind of brain injuries that are vascular. So that's 70, almost 75% of it is either Alzheimer's or vascular plus Alzheimer's. And then there's vascular dementia as its own right. I mean, people argue about how, often, how much of that. There are some specialty, unusual kinds of dementia. There's Lewy body. There's something called frontotemporal. There's associated with Parkinson's. It's not common, but it certainly happens. And there are other things that we like to think of as the reversible dementias. These are not as common as they used to be historically. This is among the reasons we do some of the testing we do. If somebody might have memory issues, we always check a B12 level because we know B12 is one of the divert, uh, reversible dementias, as is a thyroid condition. A super low thyroid can certainly mimic dementia. But in the civilized modern America, we don't see it that much. They used to see it more often. Well, how do we determine, you know, we just made a list. We said, how are we going to determine which it is? Well, it's pretty simple. You ask questions like, you know, does this person have a, a high blood pressure that's not controlled? Does this person have a diabetic condition that's not controlled? These would make you think of something vascular. Does the person have extreme hallucinations, which you find out about? It's like, oh, maybe it's Lewy body. Or does the person have Parkinson's disease? That should be fairly obvious. But the, the Alzheimer's is the one that's really difficult to tell because there's no specific answer for that. As we mentioned, the plaques and the tangles are the only thing that are absolute. Now here, uh, we have a, one of the things we do in the examination is we do a simple test. And this goes back to our original slide, how we figure out what's going on in the brain. We ask questions. This test, which has been used, I don't know how many times it's been used, I don't think anybody knows, called the mini mental exam, which is just a simple memory quiz. I don't know if anybody here has ever had it administered to them. It's not a sign that you're losing it. It's just a sign that we want to assess your memory and establish a baseline. This was invented by Dr. McHugh, my former professor at Hopkins. He used to be the head of psychiatry and, uh, his, and some additional researchers, Dr. Folstein. And it's a very brief uh, memory quiz in which they ask questions. The year, the season, the day, the date. They ask the state, county, town, hospital, floor. I don't know, if you ask somebody the floor, that's sort of weird. I mean, in a hospital, maybe it made sense, but 
is not sure it translates. But anyway, if you miss it, you get a point off. You know? It's like, and then you're like, God, you don't seem that bad. I better up the score kind of thing. There are some things that affect spatial reasoning. So that's the interlocking uh, symbols. And then you also have to assess what's called the level of consciousness. A person who's asleep cannot be determined to be uh, dement have a dementia. They have to be awake and alert. They can't be like, oh, what's going on? It's like, you can't tell if they have dementia. They're not alert enough. They have to be alert. Now this test, so this test is very imperfect, but it gives us a little hint. If somebody falls around uh, 24 points out of 30, then we start worrying about uh, a real dementia being present. Often we'll do a scan. I think we all expect to have a scan. It's very controversial about how necessary a scan really is. They rarely show any pathology of a major finding, MRI or CT. Either is adequate, certainly. So the problem is we still end up, after we've done this little evaluation in the office, we're very confused. We often don't know where we are. Somebody says, I have memory loss. And, and somebody, you know, there are acronyms for this memory loss. Um, CRS, can't remember, squat, or other things. <laughs> you know, everybody has a little bit of memory loss. I mean, Kelly gave a great example. You know, we all have our moments. But when is it abnormal? So we have something called mild cognitive impairment, which has a relationship to Alzheimer's disease, more severe. Certainly anybody with Alzheimer's has memory loss. But not everybody with memory loss has Alzheimer's. Now, sometimes we try and get a better beat on this. We call in the neurologist. This is Oliver Sacks, famous for a lot of his books. Or we call in a neuropsychologist. I couldn't find a neuropsychologist, but I found a shirt. <laughs> so if anybody wants to be a neuropsychologist, I can tell you where to buy the shirt. Trust me, I'm a neuropsychologist. But they, these guys do really comprehensive six-hour memory quizzes. And the neurologist, of course, tries to delve into it in more depth. But still, we often don't have an answer. It's incomplete information. And depending on how highly functioning a person is, we often leave patients without a certainty, and we have to wait and see what time will tell us. There's new criteria now. You may have heard about it. This is a new big thing. They've set up new criteria. And this is, we're going to talk about the specific biomarkers, which are ways we can tell you have Alzheimer's disease before you know it, because that's where we're going. We'd like to be able to tell people, you have the risk for dementia. Now, when we say that, we also want to say, and we have a treatment, by the way. We better, because <laughs> I don't know that I want to hear anything bad and not have a treatment for this. It also specified in the new criteria, and these were two big international bodies, they said, we're going to create the new criteria. They also said that mild cognitive impairment, MCI, is a milder memory loss, and it always precedes Alzheimer's. That, we're just going to say that. If you call them MCI, they will eventually, you're saying that person is going to get Alzheimer's. So we're trying to clarify the, the uh, breakdown of how we see things. So in this case, the MCI now falls all within. Remember, it was outside. It was in the memory. It was sort of in between. They're saying, no, it's part of Alzheimer's. It's, it's a precondition for Alzheimer's. And the key to all this is to allow earlier recognition and treatment of the condition. So how are we going to do that? And we're going to talk about the first biomarker that, we're, that really is, is, is huge and connects a lot of items. This is, this is a positron. You've probably never seen one. You've got to trust me, they exist. I believe they exist because he said they would. And this is the nature of how far-reaching somebody like Einstein's work is. That when he did his work back in the early 1900s, he said, there is this thing called the electron. We know this. It's what we call electricity in its common form. But this is involved in many different chemical processes and involved in the atomic structure. And he said, there will be a opposite. There will be a, prop, a positron. He didn't name it a positron. But there will be an opposite particle. We need to find it. And it was this guy, Carl Anderson, who found it. And for it, he won the 1932 Nobel Prize. So when a positron which is really essentially antimatter. I want, I want you guys to realize how amazing the PET scan is, because we're going to talk about PET scans. It's antimatter. So we determined there was such a thing. We went and, this guy went and found it. And when you put a piece of matter and antimatter together, you get a perfect dissolution into pure energy. Sort of beautiful in its own way. You don't get to see it, but that's what happens. Now, so that's the, that's the positron side of this story. And then the PET scan is also a CT scanner of a sort. And you may not know this, but you, and you may or may not love the Beatles, but they funded, or they, their, their record label was EMI, Electronic Musical uh, Industries. And EMI had a research arm. 
Uh, and they started running out of money until the Beatles came along. <laughs> and they had made a lot of money for EMI. And EMI's research business went out of business. But the Beatles, I don't, I don't know how personally, but they funded uh, Alfred Hounsfield, this researcher, who was on to something. And what he was on to was the device behind him that you can see, which is the first CT scanner. This is a brain CT scanner. And for that, he, did, he won the 1970 Nobel Prize. So Nobel Prize work is everywhere. You're, it's touching you every day. We're very fortunate here. And now I do not know Eric Ryman. He is the head researcher at the Banner uh, Institute studying Alzheimer's disease. And he's, I'm not sure if he's the researcher only, but he is one of the big researchers on PET scans for Alzheimer's disease. And this is coming to the clinic. It's, coming soon. We're not quite there, but we're close. And certainly in select groups, it has some very good uh, results here. This is a normal person. This red is amyloid protein. So what he's done is send a tracer into the body. The tracer has a, a fluorine or a fluoride a molecule that will give up a positron when it attaches to amyloid. That positron will meet an electron. It will disintegrate into pure energy called a gamma ray. And then the detectors will identify that gamma ray and count it and reconstruct it in three dimensions due to the CAT scan, and you have your PET scan, okay? And Eric Ryman is, he is the person right now for this biomarker, which is being touted as the next step for identifying Alzheimer's disease early. So in other words, some of you may say, I feel great, and we do, this is what's gonna happen one day, and we're gonna do a scan like this, and we're gonna say, but you have Alzheimer's disease. I don't know if you're gonna like it or I'm gonna like it, but this is, a, this is where we're headed. We'll be able to tell. Now, of course, we have to have the dovetail have the treatment. Now, the other one, everybody hates this slide. That's a spinal tap taking place. Wah! It's got this clear liquid coming out. That's spinal fluid. And we can actually measure the tau protein and the amyloid protein in this fluid, and we can separate out those people that have Alzheimer's disease, those people that have mild cognitive impairment, and those people that are normal. Fairly closely, not perfectly, but it's, we're pretty good at it. This is another one of the biomarkers. So what are we gonna do next? What are we gonna do about treatment? And that's the next thing I wanna talk about. Our current treatments, uh, Aricept, probably the most famous and most widely used of the medications. And we're gonna get back to that little basic science we talked about at the beginning, where this medicine is going to, this chemical structure is going to enter into this gap, and it's gonna be the hero. It's gonna stop the breakdown of this acetylcholine molecule that's gonna come here to stimulate this memory nerve. And what happens is it reaches the, the other side, it attaches, it sort of does its thing, and then it releases, and it may be able to reattach itself at some point, as long as it doesn't get broken down by acetylcholinesterase. That's where this medicine works. It stops the breakdown from happening, enhancing the number of acetylcholine molecules in this synaptic cleft or in this gap. And that's how Aricep, Razidine, and Exelon work, same way. Now the problem is these, these nerves, we're enhancing this, this chemistry here, but these nerves are becoming depleted. There are less and less of these nerves to stimulate. So it's sort of like you have a V8, and as the nerves die off, you know, you can put in the best gas, you know, with the highest octane, but once you start to get down to a V2, you can't move very far. You got, you got less of these nerves, if you will. And the same thing is true for our other drug, galantamine, a namenda, which is a very curious molecular structure, which blocks glutamate at this receptor and reduces, actually it interacts with it, reducing its activity level, and this also enhances memory. So we have two medicines that work. And of course, the, the question is trying to find medicines that are gonna work on amyloid, medicines are gonna work on the tau protein, other aspects of the chemistry. The risk factors for developing Alzheimer's are important because we have to know, well, who's at risk? Well, one of the reasons we're all here is we're all concerned, because the number one risk by far is getting older. And we'll talk about the statistics in a little bit. Interestingly, and this surprised me, to be honest with you, that the family history increase wasn't as great as all that. 
I was surprised. That's very significant. But in a general family, if you said my father or my brother had Alzheimer's at a older age, not at, you know, somebody said I have a family member in his 50s or 40s and it can happen, that would be quite something. That would make you wonder about the genetics, which is in the smaller group, very rare. But if they had it later in life, it doesn't really increase your, your risk that much. Strong genetic, it, there is a, a group of people who have certain genetic predispositions very high. And in fact, patients with Down syndrome have trisomy 21, we have an extra copy of the amyloid protein. So we know that. We actually use this to create mice that will have extra amyloid that will develop Alzheimer's so we can study the mice. Now the prevalence is lower when you're younger and higher as we get older. But this does not mean that everybody here is going to develop clinical Alzheimer's. It just means that they have the underlying structure of Alzheimer's. Not everybody who gets plaques and tangles will have Alzheimer's disease. And the reason for this is it's a combination of that plus other factors. And we'll talk about those other factors. I wanted to mention other risk factors that aren't really risk factors for Alzheimer's, but they're risk factors for stroke or brain injury. And as a result, it's that additional risk factor added to the injury of the brain from Alzheimer's, the plaques and tangles, that then will uncover the memory deficits. So smoking, diabetes, uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled cholesterol, these are going to be contributors. We also know historically that people get hit on the head too many times, they end up losing memory too, much more than we would expect. Some people thought, well, it made the brain make the amyloid plaque and tau protein, like you hit somebody and that created in the brain. It's not true. It just is one more injury that the brain is sustaining. So the question is, what can we do to prevent health from deteriorating or memory from deteriorating? Uh, increase brain activity. Increase exercise. Are there medicines? Do supplements work? And I will start by saying there's some, some data that's encouraging. <laughs> but <laughs> this is, well, this, I'm not Ponce de Leon. We don't have the fountain of youth here. Now what about using your brain? Some people have the capacity to use their brain even though when you don't think they got much brain going on. And one of the ways we know about um, the effects of education and mental function or, or higher education and higher mental function, mental activities, is through a study that maybe many of you know about, because it goes to hit the magazines, Time Magazine, the Nun Study. There's a group of Notre Dame nuns in Minnesota who have donated their order to assist with the study of Alzheimer's. And they um, participate in studies. They contribute information from their historical past and their, bio their, their biography. And they also donate their brain afterwards to be studied and compared with these findings during their life. And what they have found is that if you go back in time to their original autobiographies, which I guess this order had to write, that if you found the more complicated sentence structure that was in these diaries when they were younger, the less likely they were to have the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease, and, and the reverse was true. So this is encouraging, sort of, because it's about what you could have done, not what you can do. They also found a decrease in risk in the over 75 group with reading, playing games, playing an instrument, dancing, okay? But again, it wasn't clear. There aren't great studies that show that you can reverse this if you take a person who's developing issue and start them playing an instrument or dancing. We hope there would be, but we don't have proof of that. And so these issues, unfortunately, I think require a time machine. You have to go back in time and go, dang, I should have studied harder in sixth grade. Why wasn't I studying? <laughs> I was goofing off eating candy bars hanging out by the uh, drugstore which may be my story. No, but now the other one is exercise. Um, exercise definitely has a little more data for it, and that looks more encouraging. And that's why I really wanted Kelly to be here to connect the two, because exercise is something we can all do that could help here. Now we have mouse models, uh, and we take the mice, and we put them on their mouse wheel, and then we do something naughty to them, <laughs> so we can get the brain, and uh, we're very nice about it. But uh, then we look at it under the microscope and we see less amyloid plaque. This looks like a lot, of course, for a mouse. But this, and now, how, of course, how you tell whether a mouse has dementia, it's, it's got to be complicated. I'm not a mouse expert, so I can't explain what that, you know, doesn't eat the cheese, doesn't go to the cheese. I don't know. There, there, there probably are ways. Anyway, so definitely there's experimental evidence. And then there's some studies in um, nursing homes. This is a French study. It's definitely a very well done study. It's very important that these studies not just be uh, you know, poorly designed and poorly done, showing that more exercise 
at, the, at their nursing facility with 300 residents led less progression of dementia. So there is an encouraging uh, potential here for uh, exercise. Uh, next, we're going to talk about medicines. Can medicines help? A lot of people say statins can do it, and I'm somewhat of a believer, but it's probably not the, trick, not the case that statins, which, uh, how many people here are on statins, might I ask? We're on a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of statins, and this is among the reasons, because we don't think that statins, there's no good data to support that statins prevent Alzheimer's itself, the plaque or the amyloid. But there is evidence that it prevents small strokes and other brain injury that might contribute to the uh, injury of the brain that when added to the amyloid plaque creates the clinical features of dementia and memory loss. Another contender that I'm going to mention, non anti-inflammatories, these are medicines we all take. Celebrex, Voltaren, Ibuprofen, Aleve. Can these help prevent Alzheimer's disease? There is evidence for this, mostly based on uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis and other patients who have been studied who take a lot of anti-inflammatories in their life have a lot lower risk for Alzheimer's disease. So that's a kind of proof. But there haven't been any prospective studies to prove that. This, for all of you who may recognize this, is a ginkgo biloba tree. Does ginkgo work? <laughs> now, I, I'm not a big, everybody here probably knows I'm not a huge supplement fan. And, I, and it's not that I don't, I just claim the skeptic. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. And there aren't a lot of really good studies that are considered acceptable for proving that ginkgo works. I know the 3,000 years of Chinese history supposedly prove it, but I'm not sure exactly what it proves. But when they studied this seriously, there was a big study done by the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2002 that basically said there is no clear-cut evidence that ginkgo has an effect to prevent dementia or Alzheimer's disease, and it's still claimed to do so. So there's just no evidence. Here, I wanted to talk to you about vitamins. And there is some interesting, those of you who remember Bobby Riggs, I don't know if anybody remembers him, but yeah, that's a blast from the past. He used to, I remember when I was a kid, he used to eat bi vitamins by the handful to prove his, his physique and his prowess. Of course, he lost to Billie Jean. Do vitamins help? And the answer is, there is some data that shows that vitamin E can have some beneficial effects. But again, the data ends up being very controversial. There's no clear-cut evidence. There's lots of claims. If you Google vitamin, you know, vitamin B vitamins and Alzheimer's disease, you'll find an inordinate number of people claiming it. But there is no clear-cut evidence. The data remains controversial. For any study that suggests it's useful, there are several studies that show that it just didn't work. So completely unclear that there's any role for vitamins. This um, condition, Alzheimer's, is, is very much like many health conditions. It's, um, it's an iceberg. There's an undiagnosed, unobserved component of it. And the more we can understand this area, the more we can explore it and explain it, the more we can begin treatment early with new medicines that maybe attack the amyloid protein or the tau uh, protein, um, and we can have a stronger effect in prevention. So the summary, the imperfections of diagnosing this condition, but the fact that we will improve this diagnosis in the very near future as we've improved criteria and we have these new tests that are coming out that will definitely be useful. They are not here yet. I mean, if you come to my office tomorrow and say, hey, time for the PET scan and the spinal tap, I'll be like, not quite yet. <laughs> but we're, we're, we're closing in on it. It, is, it. it will be in the next few years. New treatments come from the basic science. We saw that. That's how we understand everything we just talked about. I think that it's hard to argue against mom and apple pie, you know, mental and physical activity. Uh, you know, it's hard to argue that. I'm not sure if anybody can, wants to stand up and give me a valid argument against making an effort. I don't know. <laughs> anybody want to do it? <laughs> My kids might. My kids might come up with one. Treating blood pressure and cholesterol are important. Diabetes too. Controlling that so you reduce the risk of additional factors that can come into play for dementia. And supplements and vitamins, they just remain uncertain. We don't know. This quote from Carl Sagan, skeptical scrutiny, the means in science and religion by which deep thoughts can be winnowed away from deep nonsense. We have to understand this more. I appreciate you all coming for the memory talk. We'll take some questions. Thanks very much. <laughs>